because I'd like to kind of focus it towards the um, orthopedic world. Okay. All right. I'd love to do that. Yeah, I figured you would. And um, so my friend of program and I, um, I'll, I'll contact you and we'll come okay. and do something. Yeah, and I wanted to come down and see you, you anyway. You so have to. You have to. Okay. You have to. Okay. In fact, I'm going to give you a form and have you sign it. I'll just say, I will promise to give you some dates. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. All right. All right. Well, I will introduce okay. you. Okay. So. <laughs> There's some questionnaires coming out, again, just trying to get some physical assessment from you about how the class is going, how things are going. It's really a great privilege for us today to have Dr. Ellen Pelton here from the Night and All Device Company in Fremont. And I think it would be a nice compliment to the lecture that you saw on Tuesday from Scott, who talked about a lot of the failure modes and failure analysis that go stents. And you'll see today a lot of the science that goes behind stent development and technology. And I think you're just really going to enjoy uh, Ellen's lecture. It's going to be a warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's always a privilege to come and talk in Dr. Pruitt's class. Um, so um, I had a chance to talk to um, Scott Robertson this morning uh, about the um, about his presentation, and basically what he told me is that the message he left with you is that stints break. And it's difficult, and, and especially night and all stints, and they're extremely difficult to to work with, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Isn't that is the message I hear? I see a lot of nodding heads. Okay, so in reality, I should have come on Tuesday. He should have come today, because um, what I'd like to do is to present, and, and I would be the very first one to raise my hand and say there are challenges. Okay. How many of you are uh, undergraduates in this? Okay, so the majority. And graduate students? Okay, and slackers? Yeah, okay. There, the, the professor. How many of you are material science background? All right, so see me afterwards, we'll talk. How many of you uh, are considering uh, a degree, for example, uh, or going like a pre med? How many of you consider yourselves pre med that you want to go in and, and work? Okay, that's great. Uh, I'll have some gory pictures later on about what happens inside of bodies. Um, what I want to talk about today is very simple. We have a technology. This is when people ask me what I do for a living, I say I am a night and all metallurgist. Okay? The word metallurgy doesn't appear anymore, it's now fluffed out to be material science. Okay? But I'm, I'm, I kind of harken back to the old days of true metallurgy, understanding my thought is if I can understand how the atoms behave, then I can understand how a device made from those atoms can behave. Okay? So what I want to do today is to give you a little of that flavor. Okay? I don't want to convert the rest of you into material scientists, although if you are interested, I will be <laughs> on the hallway afterwards <laughs> signing you up. Okay? So, Night and all. How many have worked with night and all before? Have seen night and all? Have played with night and all? Okay. Besides Scott's lecture where he showed everything breaking. Okay. What I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about what goes on behind it, the science behind it. Okay. So we're going to ask or answer, try to answer a few questions. First of all, what is night and all? Okay. Second of all, where is night and all used? Um, predominantly in the medical device market. That's what I'm going to focus on, which I think is appropriate for this particular class. There are other uses of it, which when we look at those other uses, uh, we can say, ah, I may be able to use that particular type of technology in my medical device. Okay? How do you design with it? Scott's already given the answer. Oh, it's too difficult. Give up now. <laughs> okay? So here we go. I have been in this field for, for way too many years. What, here's what happens. I get phone calls from uh, engineers from every, virtually every medical device company in the world. And they always call me up and say, I need something that has the flexibility of night and all, but I need it to be as stiff as stainless steel. Okay? We call that unobtainium. No can do. One of the things they always want to do also in their uh, designs of night and all devices is they want to focus on one aspect. And they always call it, 
what's the modulus? And I go, oh, please, please, please don't ask me what the modulus is because you need to consider other things when you design. But they always come back to you. Bec how many of you have taken a mechanics class where you, you do like uh, strength of materials and stuff? So you know this stuff. The moment of inertia and, and all this kind of stuff. And it always has this E in there, doesn't it? I'm going to show you some of that today, too, and show you how we can get rid of it. Okay? But, uh, um, and I'll provide these as PDFs to Professor Pruitt so you can see this. This is important. There's a lot of similarities with stainless steel. For example, if you look at the electrical resistance, people want to use actuators and they want to put a, a, a voltage across there and actuate it through uh, joule heating or something. You know, you need to know the resistance, okay? But let's move on from that. What is nitinol? Nitinol is an acronym. Uh, nitinol was, if you will, discovered at the Na Naval Ordnance Lab in the mid 1960s, okay? As I look around the room, I don't see anybody, hardly, who was born in the 60s. Is that, uh, hardly, I said hardly. <laughs> and I'm not going to point out ages, Professor Pruitt. Okay. So, <laughs> she's something. Anyway, um, in the 1960s, and, I, and I, I talk about this, I love to tell the story about the origin of nitinol, the discovery, if you will, of nitinol. And the reason I want to talk about that is because of the following. How many of you, for, for your parents, were, for example, were engineers back in the 60s? Okay, my father was. M yeah, okay. So, think back. You've seen old black and white movies that came from the 60s. And think about what was their dress code back in the 1960s? It's like engineers. Pocket protectors, that's one thing. What else would they wear? Short sleeve white shirt and tie. Okay. And and the white shirt, that's right. And what color was the tie, generally? Black. Black, okay. And a lot of times they were wearing suits. Unless it was summertime, then they got to take the suit coat off. That my father was always happy he didn't have to wear a suit coat into work that day. Okay, so here's what I want you to envision. It's a naval ordnance lab. So that tells you right away what kind of a community that is. Um, it's, uh, it's in Maryland. Um, and they were w researching the uh, nickel base alloys that had uh, good properties that could be used in naval ordnance things. So we won't go into those details. So they were looking at things such as nickel plus copper, nickel plus iron, nickel plus titanium. And they came across a composition that was nominally 50-50 nickel titanium. Okay? So I want you to think, imagine this. Here's a conference room, mid-60s. A bunch of mi men, because apparently back then, women were not allowed to go into engineering. Um, apparently now they are. <laughs> um, most of my classes that I teach here at campus are, are well over 50% women. Um, but w here's the deal. So they're sitting around the room. They're all, they're all with their, their dress code, the white shirts, black tie, etc. And what else were they doing besides the, and the pocket protector? What else were they doing? Smoking. Have you heard this before? Oh, okay. <laughs> and they were smoking, okay? <laughs> and they're the ones that need the sense today. So, they were smoking. So here's an engineer who had just, been, he's been working on this nickel titanium project. He had a wire, nominally 50% 50, 50 nickel, 50% titanium, and it was very bendable, rubbery. So what he did is he took it and he wrapped it around his finger. It's easy to do. And then he touched the end of it to a cigarette, and it moved. It started to unravel. So he's looking at this, and I, you know, I could bring in little jokes about, yeah, it was after a three martini lunch, which is the other thing they used to do back then. So he tried it again. He bent it back around his finger. He touched it to the end of the cigarette, and it moved. Okay? There was a mechanical motion due to an outside, outside stimulus of a temperature change. And that is the humble origin of what we call shape memory alloys. Okay? Now, it turns out all the science had been done back in the mid-30s uh, in Europe, but they were buried in some physics journals, and it took the Americans probably another decade or so to recognize that what they were talking about over here was exactly what they were observing here. Okay? But that's the, the beginning of night and all. So there's two things we want to talk about. Okay? <clears throat> and at the end of this class, I, wanna, I, I hope that you are thoroughly convinced that these two phenomena are exactly the same. 
Okay? How many of you have taken a, a good, hearty course in thermodynamics? How many of you like thermodynamics? All right, some of you. Okay, sitting in the back of the room. That's good. So, <coughs> what I want to convince you is that we have a thermodynamic function here. And one of the parameters has something to do with temperature, and one of the parameters has something to do with, uh, with uh, uh, mechanical behavior. Okay? And then when you bring the two together, you can see what happens. So we're going to talk about thermal shape recovery, elastic shape recovery, um, or we can call it shape memory and super elasticity. Okay? Other acronyms that you see. Thermal memory. It remembers its shape by a change in temperature. Think wire and cigarette. Okay? Or mechanical memory. You apply a mechanical force to the material, you release that mechanical force, and it remembers its original shape. Okay? These two are intimately linked through the atomic structure, and that's what we'll talk about here. Okay? So, shape memory and super elasticity. Okay? I love giving this particular type of lecture, and I've been all over the world. I've been privileged to go all over the world and give this lecture. People always ask, well, wh wh you know, your favorite audience. And it was my son's kindergarten class. Yeah, you laugh. That's good. So you're awake. <laughs> <coughs> Why kindergarten? Kindergartners are not afraid to show emotions, right? When they see something they like in a store, a candy store, there's no question that they like that. They run to that, okay? When there's something, when a parent does something to the child they don't like, what do they do? They show their emotions, okay? I'm giving you, for the next hour or so, permission to be a kindergartner, okay? When I do this demonstration to kindergartners, they ooh and ah. You're welcome to do that. And we won't tell anybody outside of this room, although it is webcast, right? <laughs> okay, so you're not being seen on the webcast, and so you're this anonymous group sitting there, okay? Thermal shape memory. Here's a nitinol tube. It's metallic, whoops, I can cool it down, I can bend it, <laughs> and that's not even the fun part yet, okay? As I warm it up, just through body heat, it goes back to its original shape, okay? put too much cold spray, otherwise it would have been instantaneous and you would have been so mesmerized. Okay? So now it's back into its original shape. Macroscopically, when I sprayed this, maybe I should ask you because I sprayed you as well, um, <laughs> did that change at all? Did you see anything on the outside when I sprayed it? What did you see when I just sprayed it? What? It bent? No, before I, before I s bent it. Uh, yeah. The frost, right? The yeah. Yeah, the white stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're graduating when? <laughs> Are you a grad student or undergrad? Don't even answer. That's okay. So the, what's that? Uh, yeah, there you go. So the, the point is, is that macroscopically we didn't see a change. And what I want to show you in the next few slides is that microscopically things change. Okay? So now this is back at room temperature. I've, I've warmed it back up. And let's bend it the same amount. Ooh and ah, okay? We used to give these talks and we call it the magic of shape memory. There's no magic, it's all physics. It's all physics. What I can do, I can recover this shape in two ways. I can either do it by changing temperature, we call that shape memory, or I can do it by changing the mechanical loads on the material, and we call that super elasticity or mechanical memory. Those, the two phenomena are absolutely linked, and here's why. Nitinol is a metallic compound. It's an intermetallic compound, and the, you, we need to learn two phrases. We're going to learn the phrase austenite, and we're going to learn the word martensite. How many have taken, like, an intro to material science, E45, right? Yeah, who taught it? Not even that, don't answer that, it's okay. Um, so you probably, yeah, Professor Morris. I had him, too, when I was a young lad here at Berkeley. Um, <laughs> 
So you probably heard the phrase arsenite and martensite before in, in reference to steel, didn't you? Right? Okay. So night no metallurgists are not proud. We will steal from anybody. Okay? <laughs> so we term our phases, the high temperature phase is called arsenite. Okay? And um, on your left, on the screen there, you see an optical uh, micrograph of the microstructure of austenite. Okay? Uh, next to it is an X-ray diffraction pattern. Okay? Just looking at those two together, I can tell exactly that that's the austenite phase and not the martensite by comparison. We'll, we'll see that in a minute. In the bottom right-hand corner, this is the crystal structure. This is a three-dimensional crystal structure of the austenite. Okay? If you want, you can label the blue atoms there as nickel and the red one as titanium. Okay? <coughs> and then you, we can do atom counting and find out that actually the ratio is one to one, but we won't worry about that right now. Okay? The important thing is, is just look at this and say, okay, this is what crystallographers, this is what metallurgists look at, and they say, I have um, uniquely identified this phase as austenite. Okay? We call that the parent phase. It is stable at high temperature. High temperature could be liquid nitrogen temperature. It could be 100 degrees C. Okay? And the, the last bullet point there is that it's ordered. It's an ordered crystal structure. And it would be like this. Nickel, titanium, oh, the vacancy. Nickel, titanium, nickel, titanium, nickel, titanium, nickel, titanium. The nickel is always surrounded by titanium. The titanium is always surrounded by nickel. Okay? That's what we mean by an ordered compound. Okay? So, austenite in 2D. Let's make it really simple. Let's make it a, let's take that cube, let's project it down. It's not an exact projection, uh, but let's project it down into a two-dimensional plane. And you can say that all the blacks are nickel, all the reds are titanium. Awesome. Okay? And the reason I put the thermometer there, because I thought that Jevon was going to be here, and I wanted to make sure that he understood that this was the high temperature phase. Okay? So the thermometer's at a high temperature. Okay? He walked in perfectly. Okay. Martensite, by comparison. Look at the optical uh, metal uh, uh, metallograph, or micrograph, sorry. Uh, the micrograph. Substantially different than the austenite, isn't it? Okay? See those little striations in there? Those are twins. We'll talk about twins in just a minute. Okay? Look at the X-ray diffraction pattern. Pretty substantially different than the austenite, isn't it? Much more complex. Those peaks tell us where the atoms are in the material. Much different. That tells us it's, it can be uniquely identified as a different crystal structure, therefore a different phase. Okay? It happens to be uh, a monoclinic phase. Who knows what a monoclinic phase is? You should know this. You know what a monoclinic? Yeah. Dude, my story is going to be better than yours, so do you mind if I tell it? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> monoclinic. You've been to the grocery store, right? You bought a box of cereal, or maybe somebody bought it for you. Um, so you go in there, and you know what a, a, a cereal box looks like. It's taller than it is wide, and it's wider than it is thick, right? And all the angles are supposed to be 90 degrees. If you look at a cereal box, you can walk by and say, that's orthorhombic, and you'll impress your friends and family. Okay? That's an orthorhombic crystal structure. That's the, the shape of it. Okay? If, however, you go to the grocery stores that I go to, once in a while you'll see that same cereal box kind of smashed, right? And the angles perhaps are not quite 90 degrees. So here's what you do. Think cereal box, take your 90 degree angle, and shift it ever so slightly. Now you've created a monoclinic distortion of an orthorhombic lattice. Pretty straightforward, right? Crystallography in two minutes. Okay? So that's what this is. This has a monoclinic crystal structure. The atoms are arranged. The atoms are arranged like we see up there. And uh, again, you can say that the blue atoms, the blue circles there are nickel, the red ones are titanium, or vice versa. It doesn't matter. A slightly uh, different arrangement. Okay? Martin Sight in two dimensions. Jevon, it's cold. So this is the low temperature phase. That's why the thermometer is there, okay? And this is the way the structure looks. Notice that it's inherited the order. It still goes nickel, titanium, nickel, titanium, doesn't it? But it's no longer a, uh, a square uh, unit cell. It's, it's shifted. We can call that a parallelogram if you want, okay? Again, there's a difference there. We can monitor those differences through uh, lots of different ways, okay? 
Okay, Martin City Transformations. Austinite transforms the Martin site through a, uh, a phase transformation. It's called a shear transformation. I don't expect you to know this, um, again, unless you really want to get into material science. But um, there's, there's two different things that we need to take account of. One is the homogeneous um, uh, lattice strain, and we can calculate that. Um, there are ways to do that. And I've given you some, um, some crystallographic orientations there. Again, it's, it's not overly important, except for people like me that love crystallography. And the second thing that happens, and this is where it's important, is that on top of the shape change, going from here to shifting over like that, that's your, your homogeneous lattice strain, you also have a phenomenon called twinning. And let me illustrate that. And uh, we're gonna, first of all, we're gonna track the transformation, then we'll talk about that. We can use uh, a variety of different ways to monitor the transformation in the material. At, low t at, at the highest temperatures, we're gonna have this cubic structure, the austenite. When you start to cool it down, you're gonna see a, 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 a microscopic change in strain or in volume, <coughs> and that's asso associated with the formation of martensite. So the temperature at which it first starts to transform from this cubic phase to the non-cubic phase is called the martensite start temperature, okay? And that's labeled M sub S. So what do you think M sub F stands for? Finish, okay, again. We're not overly creative, we'll steal from anybody. So we have a martensite start and we have a martensite finish. We can use a variety of ways to, to figure out what those temperatures are, okay? That's uh, going along the blue line. As you start to, now we're, we're cold. It's as if I had sprayed this with the coolant spray and I'm cold. It's now transformed into martensite. As I allow it, without even bending, as I allow it to start to warm up again, it's going to hit a temperature that we've labeled here as A sub S. What do you think that starts, stands for? Austenite start. See, you could have been a metallurgist. Okay? Now, it goes, and so we've now started to create a few grains worth of, of austenite. And then we finally get to the temperature. As we increase the temperature, we, we reach A sub F. And above A sub F, it's 100% austenite. Okay? And we can cycle that time and time again. So it goes, it's a, it's a phase transformation. Uh, it's well understood from that perspective, okay? A lot of what we do is trying to control this transformation, okay? This is what I'm talking about. Lattice invariant strain, this is twinning, okay? Now, is anybody here a, a, a twin or have twins in their family? Okay, a lot of times I do. Your hands have a, a mirror relationship or a twin relationship, okay? You put the two hands together, it's as if you have a mirror plane or a twin plane in between them, right? So you, per in most cases, we perfectly project your left hand onto your right hand through a twinning operation, okay? There's science everywhere, okay? So a twin relationship in terms of the crystal structure is very straightforward, okay? There, I, I, what I've drawn there is a, is a black horizontal line that I can consider to be a twin plane, okay? And if I look above, um, you pick up, for example, a red atom, and you look uh, at an angle to that, and you'll see a black atom. If, if you flip that through the mirror plane, so think of the mirror, so it's horizontal, you think through there, and you'll see another black atom, okay? So that defines a twin plane. Why is that important, you say? We don't want to be crystallographers. The reason that's important is because when we transform from austenite to martensite, when I spray this down, what I'm forming there is actually twinned martensite. Why is that important? The reason it's important is because um, when I put a little bit of a stress to it, what it does is it deforms through moving the twin planes, and that's what we see right there, okay? On your left-hand side, you'll see the twin Martin site. On the right-hand side, um, oh, on the right-hand side, what you see is the, the, the deformed Martin site, okay? So the reason it is so easy, once I cool this down like this and I'm running out of spray, once w the reason it's so easy to bend like this is because all I'm doing is moving some twin boundaries, okay? Really straightforward, okay?
and it makes it super simple to move. And it makes it so simple that we have what is, what is considered to be a very low yield strength in the material. Okay, and we'll talk about that with respect to stents, etc. Okay, now. <coughs> That's the heavy-duty crystallography, so you can all take a deep breath, you can relax a little bit, because I won't go into too many more details with that, okay? But I do want to show how we can put all these facts together, okay? The shape memory effect. If I have a rod at, at high temperature, at room temperature right here, what phase is this in right now? Austenite, right? Okay? If I take this spray and I cool it down, what do I form? Not just martensite, the twin martensite, right? Because that's the preferred uh, way for the transformation to occur. If I then take that twin martensite and I'm still cold and I apply a stress to it, what am I going to form? Deformed martensite, okay? If I now heat that deformed martensite back up to higher temperature, what do I have? Austenite, right? You ever heard kindergartners with their lists try to say austenite and martensite? I could get them to do that, okay? So they too understood high temperature is austenite, low temperature is martensite. And you can cycle back and forth all the time, okay? Sometimes when I'm in the office, that's all I do because I have to sit in conference calls, okay? <laughs> Anybody want to be a manager when they grow up? Don't do it. It's not that much fun. Okay, so. Though that's the shape memory effect. Now, what are the things that we need to do? Okay? What are some of the things that we can bring some science to this to actually understand exactly what's going on? I'm in a medical device industry. I work for Johnson & Johnson. If I just said to the customers, the doctors, ooh, isn't it gee whiz? They're going to say, who cares? We want to know specific things. There are going to be quality engineers that say, I need to know exactly what the AF temperature is. Okay? So we have methods to do that. <coughs> One method to do that is through differential scanning calorimetry, okay? Does anybody know uh, uh, calorimetry? It's when you have any kind of a transformation, there's either going to be a heat release or a heat absorption, okay? It's either going to get hot or it's going to get cold, okay? And that's what these DSC curves tell us right here. The exothermic peak tells us we're going from austenite to martensite. The endothermic peak on the bottom is going from martensite into austenite. So I need a volunteer from the audience. It doesn't hurt. Okay, I've used Professor Pruitt in the past, but she's had her fun. Okay. We, we got to have a volunteer. Right there. Come on up. Grad student or undergrad? Grad? Oh, perfect. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to prove to your classmates about there's an exothermic and an endothermic reaction. And what you're going to do is you're going to look at them. You're not going to look at me. And what you're going to do is you're going to lightly grip the middle here. Right there. No, right about there. Okay. And you're going to watch her face and be expressive because you're, <laughs> you're, you're a <laughs> kindergartner. Okay. Oh, right. Put you back in kindergarten. Okay. So when I transform from austenite to martensite, come on. <laughs> What happens? <laughs> it gets hot. It gets hot. So would you like to express that a little bit? Ow. There you go. <laughs> All right. Now, we've just transformed from austenite to martensite. And look what happens when we transform from martensite to austenite. Look how expressive she can be. It gets cold. Oh, wow. <laughs> Please give her a hand. Thank you very much. Right. You have a long, bright career ahead of you. <laughs> Proof positive, it's a first order phase transformation because there's a heat release or a heat absorption as you go from one crystal structure to another crystal structure. Okay? Obviously, if you're going to uh, if you're gonna make a medical device, you're not gonna be able you don't want to feel this going on inside, but there is enough uh, uh, energy to do that. Okay? Let's talk about mechanical properties. And I want to bring this up because we're later on we're gonna talk a little bit about the shapes of the stress strain curves and how we can use that in order to um, in, in order to design with night and all. It's not just gee whiz all the time. We actually have to do some work, okay? Stress strain curve. You've all seen stress strain curves. You probably see a lot of stress strain curves of linear elastic materials such as aluminum, such as steel, such as copper, such as just about all metallic materials that we, what we deal with, 
materials in your strength of materials class or probably all linear elastic materials, okay? What's going on? This is a stress strain curve of martensite. So this is as if I had cooled this down and now I start to bend it. What's going on? First of all, we start with what? What's, th what's that depiction of? That is the twin martensite. As soon as I start to pull it uh, a little bit uh, further, I've now transformed from twin martensite into deformed martensite, haven't I? Okay. As I pull it uh, out to about 6% strain and release it, there's what's called a permanent set. It's there. It's like when I cooled this down, I bent it, I held it there for a while, and it didn't move for a while, did it? How did I get it to go back? You've got to heat it up, right? Okay. I can't do it mechanically. I have to do it by heat. Okay. <coughs> now I've... Uh, I've taken it to 6% strain, I've unloaded it to zero stress, I've reloaded it, and what do I have? 100%, what's the structure? The form Martin site, isn't it? Okay? Now, we're going to contrast that to the behavior of um, starting with austenite in a little bit. Okay? So where is it used? This phenomena of, of having it in a Martin City configuration doing some kind of a mechanical uh, deformation to it and allowing it to heat it back up to room temperature or to a higher temperature has made its way into lots of applications. For example, constrained recovery. Okay? I don't know what kind of airplane this is. Um, my colleagues know that, but I've, um, <coughs> I, don't, I don't know what it is. But it's one of those, it's an airplane that was actually, it's a military um, airplane that actually used nitinol to join the hydraulic couplings. If you've been on any kind of aircraft, you know that um, th everything is, all the wing flaps and everything move by hydraulics. So you have a very high pressure hydraulic fluid going through the material. If you use tubes made out of titanium, they're extremely difficult to weld. Okay? Anybody have a, a, a titanium bicycle frame? Okay? You have an aluminum bicycle frame? Okay? Aluminum and titanium are very difficult to weld, and you get those ugly weld joints. Okay, much different than steel. So if you see an ugly weld joint on a bicycle, you say, oh, that's either a titanium or aluminum. If it's fatter, it's aluminum. If it's skinnier, it's titanium. Okay? So what they want to do is they want to use a mechanical coupling to be able to join the, the pipes together, the titanium tubes together. So what they do is they take a huge chunk of nickel titanium, they use a CNC mill to, to, uh, to drill it out and put a pattern on the inside, they ram a huge mandrel, they, they cool it down to liquid nitrogen, they ram a huge mandrel through it to expand it out into a larger diameter. They ship those expanded couplings in liquid nitrogen to the, the site, for example, Lockheed or Boeing or McDonnell Douglas back in the day. And what they do then, they, they reach inside, uh, grab one of the couplings and place it over the top of the, uh, the tubes and allow it to warm up. And as soon as it warms up, you form a coupling. Okay? It's a good live mechanical joint. Okay? Now, is this technology dead? No. They still use little mechanical joints, little rings, to go around, for example, to hold things together. There was a time when they were thinking about using that with a lot of the scotches uh, in, in, out of Scotland uh, so that people couldn't uh, drain it out, put the cap back on, and then sell rot gut you know, in, in various places in the world. Okay, so a lot of good applications for that. <coughs> this just happens to be uh, one of them. Okay, so constrained recovery actuators. Okay, people love this shape memory effect. What they like to do is they like to heat it up and cool it down, heat it up and cool it down. And one way you can use that in a in a good engineering application is with a spring. That's what a spring does. It moves, right? <coughs> so, what they did. This is this is an anybody drive a Mercedes besides Professor Pruitt. <laughs> so, Mercedes-Benz. Some would argue a very good, high-quality car. They had problems with their automatic transmissions. And what they found is that at lower temperatures in Germany, it gets very cold. I just came back from there. Record snowfalls, very, very cold. Their transmissions don't shift well. If you're going to sink all that money into a Mercedes-Benz, you want your transmissions to shift very well. Okay, at low temperatures. So what they found is that if the engineers found is they could divert the automatic transmission fluid through different channels, 
then, uh, then they could get it to run smoothly at low temperatures, but it would run poorly at high temperatures. So then they came up with the idea of using a shape memory spring. Okay? And what it does is it works against, it works against a steel spring. So at, at very low temperatures, it, the spring is martensitic, and the steel spring overcomes the mechanical forces of the, of the nitinol spring. As it starts to warm, and then the fluid is diverted a certain way. And what you see in the, the bottom uh, corner there is a little insert. There's two little springs there, and it opens and closes the valve. As the temperature starts to increase, it starts to get to AS temperature and AF temperature. At that point, the, the nitinol spring has overcome the forces of the steel spring, and you've opened up a valve or shut down a valve. Okay? Pretty clever. Okay? Pretty clever. <coughs> Automotive industry is looking for savings of parts per pennies. They're not interested in nitinol, unfortunately. Only Mercedes can afford this technology at this point. <coughs> so, actuators. Now, here's a very clever design. <coughs> Who hasn't been in a very hot environment and they're just too fatigued to be able to roll up their sleeves to cool off a little bit? <laughs> So why not make very fine fibers of nitinol <coughs> that have a very specific transformation temperature and weave it into the fabric? Brilliant idea. Leave it to the Italians, the fashion industry, to do this. This is a true product. This is what they make. And what they find is that as the temperature uh, increases, your body temperature, the sleeves start to spontaneously roll up. <laughs> And that's not the only product they make. They make one that all you have to do, for example, how many of you got up this morning and said, oh, goodness, I don't have time for breakfast because I have to iron my clothes to go to school? <laughs> okay, none of you. Well, Italians do that, apparently. But here's what they found. If you weave this night and all wire through there, all you have to do is hold it up with a hot air gun, a hair dryer, and it spontaneously de-wrinkles because it goes back into shape. <laughs> Okay, we suggest not going in that direction when you, when you design things. But here's one. Here's also thermal actuation, okay? This happens to be one of the, uh, not the original, but one of the original um, orthopedic uh, d uses of, uh, of nitinol, okay? Broken bone. This is a patent from 1974. I don't know if you can read it from there. You have a broken bone. You put this plate in there. You skew it in. It's in the martensitic configuration. You hit it with hot saline or perhaps a little trickle voltage to heat it up. It comes back together, and it helps in the healing process when you bring the bones back together. Okay? And they, they do this now with stainless steel and with titanium uh, plates. But <coughs> this is night and all. And this keeps... This comes up, and then it goes down, it comes back up, and so every few years, this is a new idea, okay? Super elastic effect, okay? The majority of nitinol de medical devices use the super elastic effect, and when I take this rod, and when it's in the austenite configuration, and I bend it like this, I am f um, forming deformed martensite, okay? When I release it, it goes back to austenite, and that's what's depicted right here. It goes from austenite to form martensite and back and forth, okay? At a constant temperature. It's a temperature above A sub F, okay? One of the problems with using nitinol in an automotive um, atmosphere <coughs> or environment is that it gets very, very cold. It might get to minus 40, minus 50 degrees C in some parts of the world. On the other hand, if you're uh, in the Sahara Desert in certain environments, you might get, um, you know, uh, well above 40, 50 degrees C, okay? That's a huge range for this to continue to work, okay? If we can find an environment that has a relatively constant temperature, and make use of the super elastic ef effect, we may have found a gold mine, okay? How far can your body uh, change in temperature before you die? Not too terribly much, okay? So that's the environment that we're in. <coughs> but we're gonna talk a little bit about stress-induced martensite, okay? This is a stress-strain curve of uh, a material that starts out in the austenite configuration Okay, there's my austenite. The atoms are nice in a square arrangement. I get up on the middle of what's called a plateau, and I've transformed from austenite into martensite, to form martensite, okay? If I go out to 6% strain and I unload it, 
<coughs> then I've, I've all the martensite that I've formed starts to transform back into austenite. Okay, if I take it back down to zero percent strain and, and take it to the uh, to higher strain levels, uh, I now have a deformed martensite. Okay, so <coughs> here's a question I want you to think of. Okay. Based on what I talked about, the technologies here, and I'm going from austenite to martensite, austenite to martensite, etc. Where's the yield point on this curve? You remember the yield point from mechanic stuff, right? Where's the the yield point, approximately? Give me the the strain value. Is it at the first deviation from linearity in my uh, linear elastic region, like it would be in a steel? The answer is no. That's the onset of the phase transformation. The true yield point in this material occurs at nominally 12% strain. Okay? What happens at yield in a normal material, in a linear elastic material? Fundamentally, what happens at yield point? Atomis atomistically, what is it? Plastic deformation. And internally, inside the material, what happens? Dislocations form, okay? Dislocations form at about 12% strain in this material. All the other strain accommodation mechanisms are by a phase transformation, okay? The material would rather transform from austenite to martensite than to create a dislocation. Cre dislocations are created, but at much higher strain levels, okay? <coughs> important stuff to know. So where's night and I'll use? Super elastic. Okay. I can't remember if the next one comes in. Oh, I'll just do it this way. Okay. Who has an old-fashioned cell phone with an antenna, a retractable antenna? That's night and all. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I know. You all have the real fancy ones, okay? But it's amazing how many night and all pieces of wire have been sold. So did you ever play, do you ever play with your antenna? It's pretty fun, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> you could be a night no metallurgist if you grow up, when you grow up. Not if you grow up, when you grow up. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, slip of the tongue. <laughs> okay, so that's night no, okay? Um, anybody a fly fisherman? Or a, a, do anybody fish? Apparently, I, I gave this talk once in Minnesota, and I was making jokes about using night and all in, in uh, fishing lures <coughs> in the lower half flight. Guy raises his hand. He goes, oh, wait, they really work. And he starts giving me this five-minute spiel on how wonderful they are. Okay? In Minnesota, don't talk about fishing derogatorily. Okay? <laughs> that's, that's a national pastime. Anybody from Minnesota here? Probably. What's that? Ice fishing, exactly, or, or Wisconsin. Okay? So is it marketing, or is it... A, a true engineering function. It doesn't matter. It sells, okay? <laughs> golf clubs. Uh, I won't ask how many are golf, golfers because I'm sure you all are uh, coming to Berkeley here, the elite place. So uh, they use night on there because of the change in elastic modulus, and, and they use uh, what's called a pixel technology we won't go into. The bottom right one wha is there, um, which I guess you can kind of see. Um, what they actually use, they use nitinol wire for the underwire bras, okay? The Japanese have adopted this many years ago, okay? And the thought being that <coughs> when apparently when you have underwire bras made out of uh, linear elastic materials, they get banged up in the washer and dryer, okay? and apparently they don't fit anymore. This is all hearsay. So <laughs> <coughs> with night and all wires, what they do is that once it goes through the wash cycle and everything, and it might get out of, uh, uh, out of place a little bit, once it gets back in the dryer, it fully recovers its shape. So apparently it's longer lasting comfort, and that's what they say, okay? <laughs> American companies are not interested in this in whatsoever. You know, all the, all the American base, like Playtex and all the other ones, have no interest whatsoever in this technology. Why? It costs more. Okay, here's an, uh, here is where it really pays off. Look at this kid. Isn't that just super? It didn't display? Que lastima. Well, what he did... <laughs> What he did is this. Uh, oh, wait, I put it in here. We can't have this not shown. <laughs> what he did is he took his glasses and he went like this. 
and then he released it and it came back okay and then you can also do that with the f the uh, the rest of it and everything and it's really quite an amazing thing okay so what he said off Deutsch was don't try this with your glasses and then he bends it so one of the guys says well, you know what he really needs is some orthodontic arch wires made of night and all to bring the teeth back into place but <coughs> um, this was actually <laughs> I know. I, I think they were from Minnesota as well. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, um, this was actually a TV commercial uh, in Germany for a company called Eschenbach, with whom we work. Okay. <coughs> night and all stints. This is by far the biggest industry for night and all. Okay. This is, these are some of the few night and all stents that are on the market. Actually, some of these are stainless steel as well. These are just some of the few ones that are out there. Everybody, every medical device company makes some kind of a stent. And that's what I want to focus on for the rest of the time, okay? You see all kinds of shapes and sizes. Stents, you've talked about stents in the class so far. Was it a good explanation? Should I skip what I'm going to do? No. <laughs> no, here's the thing. This is actually a design. This is one of the original stents that was blessed by the, the um, FDA, a Palma Schatz type stent. It's a balloon expandable stainless steel stent. Um, see that white stuff along the inside of the, the vessel there? That's your McDonald's and your Burger Kings and, and smoking. Um, that, that's what causes that plaque buildup. Obviously, the purpose of the stent is to prop that open, okay? So, what are stents? I mean, you've, you've seen this before, but just as a reminder, th it's the, the primary purpose of a stent is to prop open a vessel to keep blood flowing. That's its purpose. You can have two varieties. You can have a balloon expandable one, or you can have a self-expanding one, okay? So, it's used in all kinds of things. Here's what's interesting. Dr. Charles Dodder is considered to be the father of stenting. His first stent, a night and all spring, basically. And what he did, in the top picture there, you see the, uh, it's, it's in the Martin City configuration. He bent it into a tight spiral, put it inside the vessel, hit it with hot saline, it expanded back out uh, into a larger diameter to prop open a vessel. This is an awful design to prop open a vessel because there's the point contact is not continuous, okay? So it's a terrible design. But this was back in, um, so they say that Charles Dodder was the father from 1964, but he, he ma actually made this and did animal studies with this in the mid-70s, so it was well, early 70s, so it wasn't that far after the, uh, the advent of um, night and all. Okay, so this is just a little picture. We're going to come back to David here. David is a very good model. Look at all of these places that we get to put stents, okay, um, both on the vascular side and the non-vascular side, okay? Now, <coughs> we'll talk about some of these. I was at a conference in 1998. This is the o my only takeaway, okay? And this guy doesn't even work for a medical device company and is promoting it. So every vessel in your body is a natural environment for a stent, as they say, okay? So, let's talk about David here, and let's talk about using uh, in the carotid artery, okay? This, this you know, where the, 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 the largest population of people that need carotid um, artery surgery? Anybody wanna guess? What part of the country? In the US. What? South. South? Actually, no. But I would've guessed that too. So you're like in the same camp as I am. You would have guessed the same. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Okay? So let's take a look at this. You access the site through the femoral artery. You worm a, a, a guide wire up into the lesion site. You then bring a catheter. You deploy your stent. It expands through shape memory process. Uh, activated at 37 degrees C. And I see you didn't even see the movie. What's with your technology here? Um, I saw it here. Um, anyway, it, it opens up into a stent. Um, sorry about that. So here's the, so basically you have a before and after. And the, the bottom line is, is that basically from, from your shoulders up is a, is a very hot area for doing some kind of an intervention. So they don't, what the, if you've ever seen people with big s scars along their neck, where they've actually gone in and, and surgically opened up their um, carotid arteries, scraped out all the plaque and sewed everything back up, it's, it's pretty ugly, okay? So the alternative is to put a stent in there to keep the blood going, okay? So a lot of patients, 
that have their blockage of <coughs> 60, 70, 80, 90 percent blockage, they're not getting a lot of blood to the brain, okay? It's a, it's a great ground for strokes and for other um, diseases. <coughs> okay, so before and after, obviously you put a stent in there and it opens up and you get blood flowing. Primary purpose of a stent, get that blood flowing again, okay? So, what happens during the stent? If I put a stent into a vessel, be it the carotid artery, a coronary artery, the iliacs, uh, the superficial femoral arteries, the popliteals, etc., what happens to it, okay? So now we start to go into beam theory, mechanic stuff. Professor Pruitt asked me to do this kind of stuff, okay? So, every nitinol stent that's ever made has a similar configuration. Okay, there's variations on a theme, but the similar configurations is they all have struts. Those struts all have a certain length. It doesn't matter if it's in a zigzag configuration, as you see on the left-hand side, or if it's in a diamond configuration on the right-hand side. They all have struts, okay? And you have a certain strut length, you have a strut width, and you have a strut thickness. And what we want to talk about now is what are the important design factors to be able to make a good stent that's going to last inside the body as long as possible, okay? So let's talk about beam theory from a, uh, an angle standpoint. If I take a nine millimeter stent and I place it inside of a nine millimeter uh, mock artery, an artery, uh, 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 um, uh, either a, a latex tube or some kind of a, a polymeric tube that has a similar properties to um, an artery, this is what's going to happen. So this is my 9 millimeter stent inside of a 9 millimeter vessel, okay? And you can see what kind of an angle the strut angles have there, okay? If I put that same stent into a 6 millimeter vessel, this is what happens, okay? We call that, that would be considered to have a 3 millimeter oversizing. Okay, nine millimeter inside of a six mil mil millimeter vessel. Okay, see the change in the strut angles. Okay, now you put it in a three millimeter, that's a more severe angle. Okay, so what this suggests then, if I'm going to model, if I'm trying to understand the mechanics behind the stent and its interaction with the anatomy, what I need to, to pay close attention to is how does that strut angle, be it a zigzag like this or be it a diamond, how does that angle change as a function of uh, the, the vessel size, for example? And then we put on top of that the physio physiological loading conditions through the cardiac cycle and the muscle movements, et cetera, inside the body. So that's what I want to focus on. So I want to walk you down this road from a, uh, not a super simplistic standpoint, but um, uh, to give you kind of the flavor of what we do, okay? So upper left-hand corner, that's a finite element uh, model of uh, two struts, okay? We call it a two-strut model because uh, what we want to do is now is to simulate what happens when we deflect that to, to, to a, a, a sharper angle and then to open it back up, okay? And what we're looking for are the maximum principal stresses and the maximum principal strains, okay? When you submit this to the FDA, they love it because they love colored pictures, <laughs> just like kindergartners. <laughs> Seriously, they're all over this stuff right here, okay? Now, a lot of beam theory has to go be behind this, and I, I don't know how well you can see the, the images there. What's important here is that in all cases for a self-expanding nitinol stent, you're going to manufacture the stent larger than the intended vessel. You will put a nine millimeter stent into vessels that are six, seven, or eight millimeters in diameter. So there's an interference fit, if you will, okay? So what we do is we take a look at the, the various angles there. You can see a theta one and a theta two. Uh, the, the image on the right hand side there is actually a blow up of um, the smaller one. And basically we can start to do some geometry. And here's what's interesting, okay? The strut length is L. And the, and the diagram below, those would be either AD, AB, or AC. That's the strut length. The strut length does not change as a function of angle. And what we're interested in is looking at the total deflection of the tip, because that's what's going on, right? If you hold one constant and you're doing a, a, a tip angle change and a, a deflection. 
okay? So we can say that the angle ABC is an isosceles triangle. We can do some very simple geometry, and we come up with that, that for a first order approximation, our tip deflection is, uh, is proportional to the length and it's proportional to the sign of the change of angle, half angle, okay? So the, the total displacement or deflection is two times L sine uh, delta theta over two, okay? Again, this is very simplistic first order approximation uh, mechanics, and we're gonna use this later on, okay? So now, if we now have the, the, the displacement or the deflection, what about the forces? Because my stent inside, if it's going to keep that vessel propped open, it's, it has to have a certain strength to it, a certain force, um, exertion force, so that I can interact with the vessel, okay, appropriately. So again, we can use beam theory. This is nothing more than a cantilever beam. Um, and we can look at the moments that uh, are exerted uh, by the application of a load at the end of um, this beam, okay? So we can look at the moment on the left-hand side. We can look at the moment on the right-hand side. Obviously, they're equal and opposite um, when you have support at the, that one end, okay? So what's important about that is that we can... Uh, again, first order approximation, we can derive the, the, the total force, okay? The total force is an equation that you've seen many times. What's the E stand for? Elastic modulus. That should give you a hint about how appropriate these equations are. What is I? <coughs> Moment of inertia. So we take into account the cross-section geometry of the beam that we're, um, that we're moving. Is it a perfectly rectangular? Is it trapezoidal? What's the size of it? Okay, what's the geometry? So we have to put that in there. Now, here's what's interesting. The force is inversely related to the cube of the length, okay? So if you have a stubby little strut, you're gonna get a lot of force out of it. And that's what we're gonna talk about as we progress. And that's one of the final slides here. So we're gonna say, what happens when I change my strut length? Okay? Now, that total force obviously can be then deconvoluted into an axial force and a circumferential or hoop force. Okay? And what we're interested in is F of theta, which is the circumferential or hoop forces, um, which is nothing more than the total force times a cosine factor of, of theta, okay? of the angle of deflection. Okay, so I'm just setting you up. So here's just kind of a review of some of the equations that I'm sure that you all loved when you took the courses. So <clears throat> now, what we really want to do is to convert these forces into hoop forces and hoop stresses. Okay, so again, we go to Rourke's, we can look up in a handbook, we can look at this and say, great, uh, sigma one, uh, which is along the length of this little thin wall tube. Uh, uh, sigma is equal to zero, so there's no stress along there, but the circumferential or hoop forces or stresses uh, is, is proportional to the internal pressure that you have, it's proportional to the diameter, and it's inversely proportional to the wall thickness, okay? Again, this is setting up. So if we could make a stent out of a tube like this, and if it was fully linear elastic, we have it made. This is, this is all the mechanics that we would need, right? Okay. Luckily it's not, otherwise some of us wouldn't have jobs. Okay, so <coughs> now, not only that, but now we're gonna put it into a very dynamic environment. That dynamic environment has, one of the components is, is that you, that you have the cardiac cycle. You have the systolic and diastolic um, pressure differential uh, of your heart beating. So every time the heart beats and your muscle moves like this, um, your, your vessels increase in diameter and decrease in diameter just by that motion alone. If I put a stent in there, guess what? It has to follow along the same way, okay? So we can talk about the hoop stresses and the hoop forces there, okay? Now, let's talk about what actually happens with a, with a stent. If I take a stent, such as this, this happens to be a large one so you can see this, and if I could crimp this down into a very small diameter, and if I do that radially, okay, um, and I have it in a, um, uh, what I'm going to, what I'm going to do is to move along the upper plateau. If it starts off at austenite in this configuration right here, what is it when I get it out to 6% strain as I have it shown here in a small diameter? What, what, what phase do I have? Okay, it's deformed Martensite, isn't it? Okay, so 
not just in the tubes from which the stents are made, but also in the actual stents, okay? As I start to radially compress this stent, in this case right here, they're made up of diamonds, so I'm taking these diamonds and I'm moving it down here. First order approximation, I can use the equations I showed you to get the tip deflection. I can now use that tip deflection into the equation to get the, to the forces. I can then, from the total force, give you the hoop forces uh, on hoop stresses, okay? So I've crimped it down, uh, and it's in a small configuration, okay? So what that means is it's now in a delivery system. Once it's in a delivery system, I can go sterilize it. It goes to 60 degrees C if I do ETO sterilization, and now I'm ready to deploy it into a patient, okay? I'm not going to ask for volunteers for that, so you should be okay, all right? So now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to deploy that stent. See the shape of the curve here? This is exactly what I showed you a little while ago. So we start off um, with an open configuration like this. I then radially compress it. I form to form Martin site. I'm uh, going along a plateau, and the further along the plateau, the more Martin site that I'm forming. I then release this into the bloodstream. I go into the lesion site. This stent is going to interact with the vessel. Remember that the stent diameter is larger than the vessel diameter, okay? So what I have here, if you would say, look at the bottom what we call the plateau, where I say deploy, and look at the arrow, the double uh, arrow that's underneath, okay? Somewhere in that region, this stent is going to interact with a vessel, okay? And the amount of force that the stent exerts against the, the vessel is called the chronic outward force. FDA is all over this. They want to know, what's the COF of your stent? And then we ask them, well, how much oversizing, et cetera, et cetera, okay? That's a very important parameter. It's so important, that's what we're going to focus on in our little design example here, okay? We're going to figure out what is the best strut length, for example, to get the appropriate COF, okay? So there's my chronic outward force. Now, I'm going to show you something else in a minute. In fact, you can see the small slide next to it, and it's called the radio resistive force. What's the difference? The chronic outward force is the force of the stent against the vessel. It is the force of the stent interacting with its environment. Okay? Next slide. If I have this stent and it's now, uh, I now have, let's say I have a 10 millimeter stent, I put it into an 8 millimeter vessel. Okay? 2 millimeters oversizing. You know those things that I was talking about that those uh, 1960s engineers wore around their neck that would constrict their neck like this, those tie things? And if you have a stent in your carotid artery, what do you think is happening to that carotid artery? Okay? What it's doing is it's smashing it. Okay? It's smashing it. And every time you tighten that tie, it's going to smash it again. Okay? And what are we doing? We're applying an external force. An external force to the stented vessel. And the amount of force that it takes, or amount of stress that it takes, has its name, and it's called the radial resistive force, okay? And that's the external force acting on the stent, okay? Two differences. One is the COF, one is the RRF, and we call that a bias stiffness, okay? The two values are not the same, okay? Now, what happens next? So now we have the stent inside the vessel. The vessel has its own mechanical properties. Ha, do you talk about that in this class? About the, the properties of the vessels? Do you do a lot of that in here? We dealt with, uh, we had just one brief lecture. One brief lecture, okay. So I, I'm not going to go into the details of that, <laughs> but the way that it can be modeled is you say, you know what? I'm going to model this interaction between my stent and my vessel as two opposing springs. Where have we seen that before? Mercedes Benz automatic transmissions, right? Okay? I have a spring here that has a certain set of properties. I can define those properties by showing you a stress-strain curve. Okay? I can also t look at the properties of my vessel. And the way that we do it in the medical device industry, the stent industry, is we talk about the amount of compliance. The amount of compliance is, is inversely related to the stiffness. It's nothing more than we model it as a linear elastic material. Is it? Heavens no. Not even close. 
but we can model it that way. So what we actually have is we have the, the properties of the vessel going one direction as one spring and with the properties of our stent going the opposite direction. If the stent is much stronger, has a much higher uh, COF than, the, f than the, the, the properties of the vessel, who's going to win? The, sp the stent or the vessel? The stent. And the stent's going to balloon out the vessel. If on the other hand I can design my stent so it's much wimpier than my vessel, who's going to win that, ar that fight? It's going to be the vessel. Okay? So what we need to do is we, we call it compliance matching. And what we're looking at here, and the reason I've drawn it in this particular way, if you convert strain into diameters, and we'll do that in a minute here, then where those two curves intersect is what's called the balanced diameter. There's a certain equilibrium that is obtained when you place this spring and this spring together, it forms an equilibrium. Okay? Now, once we find that balanced diameter, that equilibrium, then we can start adding the external uh, forces and loads, the cardiac cycle, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Now, beam theory and night and all. We have linear and nonlinear behavior. Constitutive equations, mechanical engineers, that's their dream, to come up with a constitutive equation so you can relate force and displacement, force and deflection, stresses and strains. Very easy in a linear elastic material. The proportionality constant is the elastic modulus. All those equations I've showed you before had an E in there, right? Okay? So that's the, purport, that's the constitutive relationship for a linear elastic material. Okay? And if we do that, guess what? Here's the moment. We take, if we, do a, uh, if we, we bend this in a certain way, we can get the moments in there, and we can look at this and say, guess what? Our moment is proportional to, proportionality constant C1, proportional to the strut width squared times the modulus times the maximum strain. Okay? So it's nothing more than defining that, the, the linear elastic curve right there and putting the geom geometric factors. Okay? Now, this only works below that transition point, what we call uh, epsilon naught. Okay? Once we're on the upper plateau, as we call it, or the lower plateau, guess what? Stress and strain are no longer proportional w through E. Okay? So now we say that, uh, in, in that way, so now we say that the modulus, or the slope of the upper plateau, is the upper plateau, the stress divided by E naught, because we have a um, it, it, the, we have a constant stress, in theory. On the unloading plateau, it's the same thing. So now we've defined two new moduli, uh, E sub U and E sub L, upper plateau, lower plateau, okay? And the appropriate modulus, uh, or, uh, yeah, um, moment uh, from there. We still have a, f uh, still proportional to uh, the width, strut width squared. Uh, now we substitute in the stress for the modulus, and we've, we do it proportionally with the, um, a s the strain uh, ratio squared, okay? Now, so limiting cases. If I have a stent in which I'm only, if I'm using the night and all stent, I'm only using it in the linear elastic region, guess what? I can talk about stiffnesses, and I can do exactly what I talked about, the stiffness of the stent and the stiffness of the vessel, and I can do that little uh, balanced diameter trick. Um, okay? Larger strains, now my force is proportional to the thickness, the strut thickness, is proportional to the stress, either the upper plateau or the lower plateau, and it's still proportional to my uh, thickness squared, or my, my width squared, but it's inversely proportional to the length to the first power. Okay? So, pretty straightforward. All we have to do now is to change the length and see if this follows. Okay? So, here we go. What I have here is plotted. Let's take a look at the top curve first, the blue curve. That is real experimental data on the unloading plateau of a stent. Now I'm looking at the force as a function of diameter. I take my stent. It's a 10 millimeter diameter stent. This one is not, but my test one was. I crimp it down to 2 millimeters with the appropriate strains. I can calculate very easily. Um, and now I release it. What happens? I have a range there that is rather horizontal, right in here. 
That's my lower plateau. So we approximate that as a constant stress, okay? As I continue to lower it down, it comes down into a linear elastic region and it goes out. So these are actually made a little bit larger than the 10 millimeters. It's at about 10.6 millimeters. That'll come into play in a minute, okay? As I, that's a strut length of 1.2 millimeters. If I increase the strut length to 1.8 millimeters, we have the green curve, okay? If I, and that's a lower force, lower chronic outward force against the vessel. If I, lower, if I increase the strut length to 2.5 millimeters, I've lowered it even more, okay? So which one is best? Well, let's take a look at that, okay? So, David again. Scott talked to you about fatigue and, and how dangerous nitinol stints are in fatigue, okay? This is a model of the heart moving, uh, the, the coronary arteries, and looking at all the, the motions. Obviously, we spend a lot of time worrying about that. We can now go back to mechanics, and we can take a look at basically a force balance, the internal pressures uh, versus the, the force exerted, and we can come up with a nice equation. I noticed from Scott's curves that he included this yesterday, so I won't dwell on this, but this is basically the same kind of an approach. Um, we can do benchtop testing, where we can put a stent into a mock artery of the right compliance, the right oversizing, the right pressure differential, and come up with um, uh, engineering data. What I want you to focus on is look how, how, how much you don't see it move at all. This is really a shame. We'll, we'll work on that for next year. Um, mine is moving quite a bit. Um, but what you see there is that basically as I'm pulsing the pressure, Every little zigzag is going like this, ka-chink, 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 ka-chink. That's the micromotion that leads to fatigue, okay? Now, here's Scott's slide. My data, Scott's slide, okay? That's okay. I'm working with him. He's a great kid. <coughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> we simulate this. We do a lot of benchtop testing. We come up with things. What I want to look at is the curve on the right-hand side and uh, th the details of which I, wanna, I want you to remember one number, 0.4%. That's all I want to remember. That's what we call the strain, uh, fatigue strain limit for this material, okay? So obviously we can talk about a total life approach. We can do a damage tolerant, okay? Uh, d and Rob Ritchie's group, Professor Ritchie's group, has done a lot of work in night and all uh, 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 fatigue fractures, etc. Okay, and Scott told you about how awful nitinol is with respect to the the K threshold, right? And he says he, he told me he asked you, well, what's the threshold for glass? Well, look at here; it's the same as nitinol. Okay, bottom line is, and apparently um, my former student here uh, asked the question, well, something to the do is why would you design with nitinol or something like that when it has such bad fatigue properties? The, the true answer is, and it's not that I'm trying to sell nitinol for this, it it's never sees this kind of a loading, okay? This is a force-controlled test in which if you start off with a crack of this size and let it grow like this, the game's over already, okay? So the, the, the deal is that we can't work in this regime, okay? This is great work, and it tells us a whole lot. But what it tells us is if you have a crack, forget it. It's gone. The threshold is so long, it's so low, it's gone. Forget about it. So what we have to do is to work on ways to make sure that we don't have induced cracks uh, from the beginning to put into the sample, uh, into the body, okay? That's, a, that's kind of a, a short answer to that. Let's talk, a lot, let's talk about the effects of the strut length, okay, from a design standpoint. Strut length, 1.2, 1.8, and 2.5 millimeters long, okay? Look at the differences. We saw the, the graphical representation of the data. The chronic outward force, 0 0.8, 0 0.6, and 0 0.4 newtons, okay? The way that it's described to the FDA is you actually do, it's the force per stint length. So it'd be newtons per millimeter, but I didn't normalize it that way. 0 0.8, 0 0.6, and 0 0.4, okay? So you want something very stiff, you're gonna use a short strut. You want something that's a less stiff, you're gonna use something that's a, a longer. Balanced diameter, remember the model where we have, uh, if we have a very strong stent, it's gonna, it's gonna prop open the vessel and it's gonna win. This is programmed, this was made to a diameter of uh, 10.6. Look at this, this is almost fully open, 10.2 millimeters when we have very stubby struts, okay? 
When you have the, the longer struts, now there's more of a balance, okay? The vessel's pushing in and it's able to, the, the chronic outward force is lower, so therefore it, can, it has a, achieves a lower balance diameter, okay? What's best for the body? Jury's still out. But what is important is if you look at fatigue safety, and this is the continual balance that we need to, to achieve in the medical device industry. The fatigue safety factors that I have there of 1.0, 1.2, and 2.0 is for pulsatile fatigue environment only, okay? And in my opinion, that's like a, a low threshold, okay? I'm not even concerned about pulsatile fatigue effects of night and stents, not even concerned. Every one of them does a, a great job in pure pulsatile. Okay? But what this shows is the interrelationship between a geometric uh, form, and I could have brought in lots of other things with processing and showed you how these things change as well. But if we c you, c you can either have, uh, you can have a high strength but low uh, fatigue resistance, or you can have lower chronic outward force and a better fatigue resistance for pulsatile fatigue. Okay? We talk about, in the industry, they talk about um, optimization. What, every time you heard the word optimize structure or optimize thing, I want you to substitute, word, substitute the word compromise. I have compromised my properties because I have to take something else into account. Okay? That's just the reality. Here's what I'm concerned about. This is an SFA. It's a blocked SFA. You see the, the, the dyes in there. It's a, um, a radiograph. In the upper part, you see the, that it actually, it actually stops right about your knee, okay, the popliteal. What happens? Okay, the guy has diabetes. Option, do I cut off his leg or do I put a stent in there? So they stented him. There are three stents in this area right here, overlapped, okay? It's actually two different brands of stents. What happens then? You get a nice healthy foot. Does it work? Absolutely. It props, it does its job. It props open the vessel. But what if you want to do something like get off that table and move? And what happens if you want to bend your knee like this? Okay? See the kinkiness of those, of those stents? Okay? What do you think that's going to lead to eventually? For example, if the person walks. Talk about a cardiac cycle. I'm going to give you some numbers. 400 million cycles in a 10-year period. In that same 10-year period, you're going to take uh, 10 million steps, approximately uh, a million steps a year. Okay, that's what we designed to, okay? Here's what happens, you get broken stents. Is that from pulsatile fatigue? Heavens no. That's due to the external loading from your, the movement of your muscles, the movement of the bones, etc. as things re, uh, change as you go through your physiologic cycles, okay? That's the concern, okay? So what do we do? We do more than just do throw numbers at it. We go into the lab. This is actually a good. What? The? He's focusing over there. Is that? Can you get, can you get the screen in the back? <laughs> okay. See that? This is just a continuous loop. Basically, we do we do cadaver studies. We go in there and we cut out the superficial femoral artery. Okay. Before we do that, we do lots of imaging techniques, MRI, ex, uh, uh, fluoro fluoroscopy, et cetera, to be able to see what happens to the motion of the SFA before we put a stent into it, okay? Pretty neat stuff. I'm wrapping up here as we go on to the next one. MRI, this is my colleague, 52-year-old man. He's laying down flat. He has nice, straight SFAs and popliteals. Look on the right-hand side. See these right here? Okay, his name is Steve. We call him Kinky Steve now. <laughs> he has kinks in his SFAs. Was it because he was a smoker for 20 years? Don't know. But you know what? I didn't show mine. Mine are perfectly straight. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. So we're doing lots of bench top testing, crush fatigue, bending fatigue, and axial fatigue. Because pulsatile fatigue is a minor player in the motions of the body, unless you plan to spend the rest of your life in a bed. Even if you put a carotid, if you put carotid stenting in here, if you move your neck around like that, you're putting external loads on it, not just the ties and things like that, okay? 
called the new stint material. Actually, it was the first stint material. Okay? A lot of things to think about. Number one, we have the shape memory on one hand. We have super elasticity on the other hand. Both are intimately related through the atomic motions of a cubic to a non-cubic uh, phase transformation. <coughs> Our challenge today is to come up with better and better non-linear constitutive relationships. Biggest challenge we have. Do we do this by hand? Heavens no. We're using very sophisticated finite element codes to be able to wrap all these things together. The bottom line is, is that if you're going into the biomedical field in any way, shape, or form, spend some time tearing bodies apart, spend some time in the lab, and then together you'll be able to see um, what really happens in, uh, you know, for a stent inside of a body, an orthopedic implant inside of a, a body, etc. So with that, I will thank you very much again for to come here and give the talk. <coughs>